this message, a definition of love. A definition of love. What's love got to do, got to do with it? There's a lot of songs about love. All we need is love. La, 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 la. Right? All kinds of songs about love. But then none of them knew what they were talking about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 11, let's pray. Those of you that are watching online, good to have you. Hope you get blessed tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you. We love you. I pray, God, that you would use my life for your honor and your glory. God, let your word go forth with power and anointing and, and clarity. God, don't let one word fall to the ground. Expand our minds and our, our thinking, God, and grow us, transform us. Let us be the men and women of God you called us to be. In Jesus' name, and everybody said. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, verses 1 through 11, it says this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Real quickly, this portion of scripture right here, this verse, you know, in, in the city of Corinth, they, there, was a, there was a temple where they, uh, where they were prostitutes. And the way they would worship their God is that they would come down and they would seduce men. They would seduce husbands. And when they, the way that they would let the men in the city know that they were coming down is they would come down clanging cymbals. So this is where he's getting this portion from right here. He says, he says uh, if I don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can phantom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Hello. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails. The Bible says in the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 7, many waters cannot quench love. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappear. Here it is, verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put childhood behind me. I put away childish things. So this last portion of scripture right here when it says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, God gave me revelation on that. And the way he did it was I was reading it, and I was like, what does this mean? Acting like a little baby? You know, like, you know. Uh. And then God showed me, no. He said, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I reasoned like a child. And then he, and then he showed me kids with their parents. And when babies are born... They just, mama, you know, they always taking. How many know they're always taking, right? Are you guys here? They're always taking, right? Feed me, clothe me, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, right? Right? They're always there and, 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 and very selfish. And they're just la, la, la. And sometimes, as mothers, you mistake that as love. Oh, look at he loves me. Look at he wants me. He wants me. No, he needs you. He's a child. He doesn't know how to take care of himself. And so what God is saying is this. Stop being a little child and all being about you. Everything has to be about you, coming to you. Give me, give me, give me. No, now it's time for you to grow up and start giving and taking care of people and meeting other people's needs. Amen? So when I was a child, I was very selfish. But when I became a man of God, I took care of other people. I, I watched out for other people's needs. Now, here in chapter 13, verse 2, Paul says this, he says, he gives the idea, and, and he, he uses faith to refer to it, and he says, even if I had faith that could move mountains, it would mean nothing. Come on, that's big faith. And God said, you can have the biggest faith in the world, but if you don't have love, it don't mean anything. 
Are you guys catching it? What an amazing thing I wrote right here. What an amazing thing it would be to have faith that could work the impossible, that could move mountains. But the Bible says even with that kind of faith, we are nothing without love. Even if I could lay hands on people and they could get healed, but if I'm not doing it because I love them, it means nothing. They still get healed, but it means nothing. Between me and God, it's nothing. Are you guys with me? It says, Paul is right here. Paul is emphasizing. I'm going to get into it right now. Paul is emphasizing the focus and goal of the gifts right here in this portion of Scripture. He's emphasizing the goal of the gifts. Love, not the gifts for their own sake, is the goal. We want love, not the gifts. He says, if you had all the gifts, because what was happening in Corinth, they were talking about the gifts and speaking in tongues and having all these other things. And Paul's telling them, it doesn't matter what you could do. It doesn't matter if you can lay hands on the sick and they can get healed. It doesn't matter if you speak in tongues. It don't matter if you can move mountains. If you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. Even if you give your body to be burned, it don't mean anything. Are you guys still with me? Possession of the gift is not the sign of the Spirit. Christian love is the sign of the Spirit. Paul uses the ancient Greek word agape. The ancient Greeks had four different words for for what we could translate love. The first word for love is eros. This is a word that describes erotic love or refers to a kind of sexual kind of love. That's eros. Then there's another kind of love, which is storge. Storge was a, another word for love, and it refers to family love, the kind of love there is between a parent and a child or between family members in general. And then there's phileo love. This love speaks of a brotherly friendship and affection. It is the love, it is the love of deep friendship and partnership. It might be described as the highest love of which man, without God's help, is capable of. Right? You could be a serial killer and still love your mama. That's the kind of this is talking about, right? You can still, without God's help, you can still have that kind of love because you're family. And sometimes I don't even know if that's even love. Right? So it is a love. Agape is the fourth word for love. And it is a love that loves without changing. It is a self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting repayment it is a love so great that it can be given to the unlovable or the unappealing it is a love that loves even when it is rejected agape loves gives and loves because it wants to stay with me it does not demand or expect repayment from the love from the love given i love you you should love me back it loves anyway it gives because it loves it does not love because it wants love. It gives love because it loves. It, it loves God. It understands the scripture of God. I love God. I understand God's love for me. Therefore, I love. And if you don't love me back, that's all right. Still going to love you. Agape, love gives and love because it wants to. It does not demand or expect repayment from the love given. It gives because it loves. It does not love in order to receive love. According to Alan Redpath, stay with me. According to Alan Redpath, we get our English we get our English word agony from agape. It means the actual absorption of our being in one great passion. Strictly speaking, agape can't be defined as God's love because men are said to agape sin and the world because men, you know, we love sin. How many love sin? How many love to sin? Right? But it can be defined as a sacrificial, giving, absorbing kind of love. The word love, this word agape love has little to do with emotion. It has much to do with self-denial for the sake of other people. Agape, agape describes a different kind of love. It is a love more of decision than of the spontaneous heart. As much a matter of the mind than the heart because it chooses to love the undeserving. This kind of love loves people that most people wouldn't love. This kind of love loves people and forgives those that have harmed them. It loves people that have been mean to me. People that have talked bad about me. People that have slandered your name. You still love them. 
You still reach out to them with God's love. You're still there to help them. If you see them walking down the street, you'll pick them up and give them a ride. If you see them hungry, you'll buy them a hot dog. Because you love. Your love for them has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with God's love and your relationship with God. If it had to do with us, nobody would love us. Are you guys still with me? This is the kind of love we're talking about. It's a different kind of love. It is a love more of decision than of a spontaneous heart. It chooses to love the undeserving. That would be you. That would be me. How many know we don't deserve anybody's love? Agape also has to do with the mind. It is a love more of decision than of a spontaneous heart. Agape has to do with the mind. It is not simply an emotion which, ri which rises in our hearts. It is a principle by which we deliberately live. You guys catch that? It is a principle by which we deliberately live. I choose to love. I choose. I am going to deliberately love you on purpose. I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you I'm in my right mind, with all my mind, with all the capacity of my mind, with all my heart, I'm going to love you. I make a decision to love you. Even though you don't deserve it. And it's easier for me to do it because I know I don't deserve it. So how can I not love you because I think you don't deserve it when I don't deserve it? Are you guys catching that? I don't deserve it. You don't either. Right? But we love that way. We make a decision to deliberately love. I must make a conscious choice. Listen, I must make a conscious choice in spite of what someone may have done or how they may have lived or treated me. How many know some people mistreat us? Or am I the only one? Some people mistreat us, right? They, 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 they uh, mistreat us, right? But we make, a, we make a conscious uh, choice to love them. So I make a conscious choice in spite of what someone may have done or how they may have lived or treated me. Sometimes, somebody say sometimes. Sometimes you got to do it in cold blood. Sometimes you got to do it because love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Love is always in action. I can't just say I love you. I got to show it. I got to show it. I got to give it, right? And so sometimes you got to love in cold blood. Even if I see my enemy walking down the street. Have you ever seen an enemy walking down the street? Somebody that you slandered or somebody that slandered you? And then God tells you, pick them up. Give them a ride. Well, how's your love then? Do you pick them up or you try to act like you didn't see them? Go by real fast. <laughs> I must make a conscious choice in spite of what someone may have done or how they may have lived or treated me. And sometimes we have to do that in cold blood. Sometimes we have to love people in cold blood. You ever love somebody in cold blood? I have. You gotta love them in cold blood no matter what. But remember, love's not a feeling, it's a choice. We could say, that this is a love of the Spirit because it is a fruit of the Spirit. This is above and beyond natural affection or the loyal to blood or family. doesn't matter if you're my family or not. You are my family. How many, say, how many know we're family? You're my brother. You're my sister. I'm your brother, right? And I, I love you like family. I, I, I don't think, I don't really think that I treat my family different than I treat people that come to this church. I think I treat, I try, I try not to like be like that. And sometimes it works for me and sometimes it works against me. Right? But that's the kind of love I'm talking about. I'm talking about a love that supersedes family. I'm talking about a love that goes beyond family. If I ever have to pick size, I don't pick size because you're my family. I pick size because it's right. I pick size according to God's word. 
Not because you're my cousin or my brother or my daughter or, or my aunt or my uncle, but because it's part of God's word and you're going against God's word. So even though you're my uncle, get over it. Are you guys still with me? So it's a love of the spirit. It's a fruit of the spirit. This is loving people who aren't easy to love. We're talking about a love that loves people who aren't easy to love. You know anybody that's not easy to love? I'm talking about loving people you don't like. Now, I'm going to get into the message right now. Hold on. Many Christians, many Christians believe the Christian life is all about sacrifice. Sacrificing your money. Sacrificing your life for the cause of Jesus Christ. And sacrifice is important. But without love, it means nothing. Sacrifice Important. As a matter of fact, I said it before. Christianity without sacrifice is just religion. But you need to learn how to sacrifice. But your sacrifice means nothing if it's not involving love. If you're not doing it because you love, if you're only doing it because they're your family, don't mean anything, guys. It profits me nothing. Now, love at the beginning, we see love is described by action. In this chapter 13, it is described by action words, not concepts. Paul is not writing about how love feels. There is no scripture in the Bible to tell you what it feels like to love. You know you love when you get five goosebumps on your left side and ten on your right. You know you, know you love when you can't breathe, right? It doesn't, there's no scripture in the Bible that tells you, that describes love to you. Or, I'm sorry, what love feels like. Are you guys still with me? There isn't a scripture in the Bible that describes how love feels. Paul is writing about how it can be seen in action. Because true love is always demonstrated by action. You guys catch that? Are you ready? You got your pins out. But we're going to get into it now. You ready? First of all, love suffers long. Love suffers long. Love will endure a long time. Love doesn't get a divorce. Love suffers long. Love doesn't walk up to somebody, you know what, I'm tired of you. I'm not going to love you no more. Love suffers long. It will endure a long time. It is the heart shown in God when it is said of the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. This is the scripture. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God's love is in us, we will show long-suffering to those who annoy us and hurt us. We still love people. We don't give up on people. How many know God didn't give up on us? Suffering long is the word used of the man or the woman who is wronged and who easily has the power to avenge himself or herself, but will not do it out of mercy and patience. So do you always want to avenge? Do you always want to revenge? Do you always want to pay somebody back? Because if you do, that's not love. You don't take that opportunity. This, this love doesn't pay back evil for evil. When, when, I was, when I was putting this together, I was thinking about the big payback. Bam, bam. There is no big payback. The Bible says don't render evil for evil, but instead love them. We don't pay people back. Ah, I think I should say that again. We don't pay people back. The Bible says do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Don't do unto others as they do to you. It doesn't say that. It says, do unto others, treat other people like you want to be treated. If you don't want nobody to give up on you, then you don't give up on anybody. Love never fails, the Bible says. Love suffers long. Also, secondly, love is kind. Love is kind. When we have and show God's love, it will be seen in simple acts of kindness. 
A wonderful measure of kindness, I, I, I found this in this book. It says, a wonderful measure of kindness is to see how children receive us. Children won't receive from or respond to unkind people. Are kids always running away from you? <laughs> when they see you, do they take off? Do they not want to be around you? If they do, it's probably because you're unkind. Now, let me tell you real quickly. We're going to get back into this, but let me tell you eight things that love is not. Are you ready? Love is not envious. Love is not proud. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love is not cliquish. You know, some people, they only hang around with a certain group of people. That's it. Us four, no more. Right? I mean, you just hang around with a certain group of people, and you, re you, you, you reject everybody else. That's not love. Love doesn't click like that. You guys with me? Love doesn't click like that. Love is not touchy. It's not suspicious. It's not happy with evil. Now, when I was putting this together, I want to give you the, a difference between pride and arrogance because the Bible talks about it's not prideful. It's not arrogant. Uh, arrogance is if you're arrogant, then you may believe that you're scoring. I, I got this out of the, the psychology magazine. It says, arrogance, if you're arrogant, then you believe that scoring that nice goal in the dying minutes of a match means that you have been carrying the team, that your teammates are useless without you. That if it wasn't for you, your team would have no chance whatsoever at succeeding. That reminds me of how I've been sometimes a long time ago. Somebody say a long time ago. When I used to lead worship a long time ago, I thought, man, if I leave this church, what are they going to do? <laughs> Who's going to lead then? You know what that is? Arrogance. I was arrogant. Pride is esteeming yourself more than you should. It's thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So, Love is not haughty. Love is not arrogant. Don't you not, not like being around arrogant people? They think they're better than everybody? That's not love. That's arrogance. That's pride. That's selfish. The, the other thing that love is not is love does not envy. Love does not envy. I, thought, I, I really like this part right here. Love does not envy. Envy is one of the least productive and most damaging of all sins. Envy arises from feelings of inadequacy, a sense of hollowness and unworthiness, closing the gap between what others have and what you want by having others lose what they have to make yourself feel better. It accomplishes nothing except to hurt. Love keeps its distance from envy, stay with me, and does not resent when someone else is promoted or blessed. Envy murdered Abel. Envy enslaved Joseph. And here it is, guys. Write this one down. Matthew 27, 18. Envy put Jesus on the cross. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 18, for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Envy is a killer. But the Bible says love does not envy. If you're blessed, I'm blessed. Like when when I, when Garrett was talking about how God blessed him with you know with a, a good contract and a good job, everybody should have been like, "Yay, Garrett! Go Garrett! Go Garrett! Go Garrett! Go Garrett!" But some of us were not like that. Some of us were envious. What about our job? What about my job? I, I I'm almost gonna get fired. You know. When we should have been like. Get it, Garrett. You know? Right? But because of envy, you were hating in your seat. You're the hater. You were just being hating again. Love does not parade itself. Love in action can work anonymously. 
You don't have to get credit for your love. It does not have to have the limelight or the attention to do a good job or to be satisfied with the result. Love gives because it because love loves to give. That's what love does. Love gives because it loves to give. Not out of the sense of praise. It can it can do it it can it can do it without showing itself off. When it's not love they do it because it looks good and people are watching them. They do it in a manner that will parade itself. This isn't love. It's pride. That's pride. It is pride looking for glory by the appearance of love. Look at me. I love people. That's not love. Love doesn't parade itself. It loves people when nobody's watching. It does things in secret. It loves people in secret. It, it pays people's bills in secret. It gives people gas money in secret. Right? Doesn't, you know, have to pr promote it on Facebook or anything like that. Love gives because it loves to give. Love is not puffed up. To be puffed up is to be arrogant and self-focused. It's Being puffed up speaks of someone who has a big head. Not a big hit, but a big hit. Love doesn't get its head swelled. It focuses on the needs of others. It doesn't parade itself or get puffed up. Because being parading itself and getting puffed up is simply pride. And among Christians, the worst pride is spiritual pride. Love does not behave rudely. Where there is love, there will be kindness and good manners. Love says thank you. Doesn't it bother you when people don't say thank you? I mean, you still hopefully you still do for them. You know, I hope you're not the kind of person who says, you know, I'm not gonna do nothing. They didn't even say thank you. Because that's not love. Even when they don't say thank you, you still do for them. You still, if God tells you to do it, you do it, right? Even if they don't say thank you. Amen? Because if you don't do that, if you say, you know what, they're not grateful, I'm never going to do it again, that's not love. Love does not behave really. It, it, it shows kindness and it has good manners. Thank you. Please, excuse me. Excuse me. Doesn't that bother you when people walk by and just bump you? And they don't even say excuse me? They, don't you want to turn around and say, but you don't because you love right it doesn't love doesn't behave love doesn't behave rudely I was thinking about some things that are rude you know what's rude when you're sitting in a car and you're with people, and all of a sudden, somebody calls you, and you just start talking. And they're just sitting right there. And you act like they're not there, and you just, like, and then, you know what's even ruder than that? When they were talking to you first. And then you answer the phone and start talking. Or you know what's rude? When you're on an airplane, and you're listening to music real loud. You don't have earplugs? Everybody calls it earphone things? I think there's, I don't know. You know what's rude? Smoking in front of some. We don't smoke here, but I, it's I, I, man, I hate. I like going to a store, and people are just. <sighs> I think that's rude. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Paul communicates the same idea in Romans chapter twelve, verse ten. In honor, the Bible says, giving preference. To one another also. Philippians 2 4 says, let, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is being like Jesus in a most basic way, being an others centered person instead of a self centered person. Love always put other people first. Love always puts other people first. Love is not provoked. Stay with me. Love is not provoked. We all find it easy to get provoked or to become irritated with those who are just plain annoying.
But can I tell you that it is a sin to get provoked? It is a sin because it isn't love. And we have a good example of this in Numbers chapter 20, chapter 20, verses 2 through 11. Moses was kept from the promised land because he became provoked at the people. The Bible says the people provoked him and he slammed the rock. And God told him because of that, you're not going to see the promised land. Love is not provoked. Turn around and tell love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Are you guys getting anything out of this? Love thinks no evil. This literally means love does not store up the memory of any wrong it has received. Love will put away the hurts of the past instead of clinging to them. Real love never... Now, here's, here's something else. This is victory outreach all the way right here. Real love never supposes that a good action may have a bad motive. In other words, real love is able to receive love without thinking somebody has an angle. Man, I love you. I want to do something for you. The first thing that comes to your mind is, what do you want? What are you after? Right? You ever feel like that? That's not real love. See, real, listen, this is God ministered to me on this part. Real love knows how to receive love. Real love knows how to receive love. When you have God's real love, you're, you're moved by somebody else's love and you receive it. Because it's love. Love begets love. Are you guys catching that? So when you really love, you don't think somebody's got an angle. Even though we know sometimes people do got an angle. <laughs> But because you love, that's not the first thing on your mind. What do they want? What are they after? Why did they say that? See, love, love thinks no evil. Real love never supposes that a good action may have a bad motive. That means that real love can accept love from others, not always thinking that somebody has an angle. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. It is willing to want the best for others and refuses to color things against other people. In other words, make things bad for other people. Love rejoices in the truth. Love can always stand with and on truth because love is pure and good like truth. Stay with me. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. And love hopes all things. And love endures all things. All things means all things. It, that covers everything. Now, most of us, we can bear some things. I'll put up with this. I'll put up with that. But if you ever do this, if you ever do that, I'll put up with all your stupidness. Some of you said that, right? I'll put up with all your nonsense. I'll put up with this and I'll put up with that. But if you ever do that, it's over. But the Bible says love endures all things. Love endures every, well, I'm not going to say everything because it doesn't say everything. But it says all things. Like, I'm not saying if somebody socks you in the jaw, stay there and do it again. I'm not saying that. Love ain't stupid, right? But love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. All things covers everything. We can bear some things. We can all believe some things, right? We can all hope some things, and we can all endure some things. But God, agape love, calls us farther and deeper into love for him and for one another and for a perishing world. Love denies itself. Love denies herself. Love sacrifices herself that she may win victories for God. Love endures all things. Love endures all things. Love keeps loving. How many thank 
God for God's love. Love bears all things. Listen. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love bears all things. The word, the word bear can also mean cover. This is good, guys. Pay attention to this. It can also mean cover. 1 Peter 4.8 says this, And above all things, have Fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Love covers. You know what that means? It never proclaims the errors of good men. Like, I'm not so fast if somebody's got a problem to go share it or talk about it or tell somebody else about it. Love doesn't do that. Love covers all things. I'm not trying to expose anybody. If you do that a lot, then you don't love. If you slander people, if you gossip about people, if you hear evil things about people and you can't wait to tell somebody, that's not love. Because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. It happened, all right, let me help you, bro, but I'm not going to go tell everybody about it because that's not love. You guys ain't hearing me. There are those who, as soon as they see or hear of a sin of another brother, they hurry off to tell their neighbor the juicy news. That's an ugly thing. It reminds me of a story I heard. There was these three guys that were fishing. They were fishing. And if you've ever been fishing, there's days when you fish and you don't catch anything. So you're fishing, and they're fishing, and nobody's getting a bite, and they got, like, super quiet. quiet. No bites, nothing. And then all of a sudden, one of the guys says, I can't take it. I can't take it. He goes, what? What's wrong? Man, I've been at my office. I've been flirting with the secretary. <laughs> and it's driving me crazy, and I don't know what to do. I know what I want to do, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. You guys got to pray for me. Please pray for me. Then after a while, but still a little bit quiet, then the other guy, he said, I can't, I can't take it either. I can't take it no more either. So what's wrong? He says, I've been stealing money from the office. And I'm afraid I'm going to go to jail and I don't know what to do and I need you guys to pray for me. Please pray for me. And the third guy was quiet for a long time. For a long time. And the other two guys had already confessed so now they're getting nervous. They're like, whoa, come on. You know, I know they're probably thinking, come on, bro, come on. And then finally he says, you guys got to really pray for me. He said, why? Why? He said, because I got a problem with gossip and I can't wait to get back to the shore. <laughs> there are some people that would rather spread slander than the gospel. As a matter of fact, they spread slander and gossip more than they spread the gospel. Charles Spurgeon said this, love stands in the presence of a fault with a finger on her lip. Don't say nothing. Why do you got to say something for her? Why you got to say something for her? Make it look better? You don't got to say nothing. Love believes all things. We never believe a lie, but we never believe evil unless the facts demand it. We hope the best for people. We choose to believe the best of others. Love, as far as she can, believes in her fellow man. Love believes in people. I know some people who habitually believe everything that is bad. They believe bad before they believe good. But they are not the children of love. Love hopes all things. Love has confidence in the future, not pessimistic. Love is not pessimistic. 
When hurt, it does not say it will be this way forever, and it's even going to get worse. That's not, that's, not, that's not love. Love hopes the best. Love is not pessimistic. Love has faith. Love has faith. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. We can measure. I'm going to ask the musicians to make the way to the front. We can measure our spiritual maturity by seeing how it sounds when we put our name in the place of the word love. Pepe endures all things. Pepe hopes all things. Pepe never fails. Uh-oh. There's a reason why Paul put this chapter in the midst of his discussion when he was talking about spiritual gifts because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual gifts, and then he says, let me tell you a better way. Let me tell you a greater way. Paul wanted the Christian uh, Corinthians to remember that giftedness, giftedness is not the measure of maturity. If you want to know if you're mature, it's not your gifting. It's not how spiritual you are. It's how you love people. You could come up here and preach the best message. You could come up here and, and lead worship and, and everybody could start crying. That's not, that doesn't mean that you love. The Bible says that love is greater than all that. Are you guys with me? If you want to know if you're mature, then you know how to love people. Paul was addressing the overemphasis the Corinthians Christians had on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He shows them that without love, nothing that you do means anything. So, come on, get a little good clap off me. I, I, I know this wasn't very long. I know this wasn't very long, and I know it was not. It was more like a teaching as opposed to a preaching. But I wanted to make sure that we understood what love is, because we need to understand what love is. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Love is something I do. You never stop love. The Bible says prophecies are going to stop. Knowledge is going to stop. Giftings are going to stop. Tongues are going to stop. But love never fails. Love never fails. The Bible says, Jesus said, you know that you have passed from death to life when you have love for the brethren. Not because you can quote all kinds of scriptures, not because you can speak in tongues, but because you love people. Because, you know, I know some people that they can speak in tongues, but they don't know how to love people. You got to love people. You got to bear with people. You got to be long-suffering with people, with annoying people. You got to love annoying people. Some people don't like annoying people. Get away from me. Don't let them in here. Don't put them by me. Sit them in the back. That's not love. Love, love puts up with hard people. You know, I heard this guy say this one time when he was preaching. He said, love the people that nobody wants, and God will give you the people that everybody wants. Yeah. Right? Come on, let's all stand. I'm not sure how the Lord may have ministered to you. Right? I pray that God spoke to you. Maybe there might have been something that I said that, you know, that we brought out about love. And you say, you know what, I need to work in this area of my life. I, I get very angry. The Bible says love doesn't get angry. It says that love is not provoked easily. It, you know, like if you're always getting mad at your wife, or if you're always getting mad at your husband, or if you're always getting mad with your children, that's not love. And if that's the case, right now, when we make this altar call, you should come up to the front. And you should ask God to help you with that area of your life. Because it's not good. It's not a good testimony. It's not good for your marriage. It's not good for your children. You know, how many know that, how many feel like you need to work on your love? Yeah? So we're going to open these altars this, this evening. If you say, you know what, there's some areas in my life that I need to work on. The altars are open. Come to the front, spend some time with Jesus, and ask God to make some changes in your life. Amen? Hallelujah.
as a Christian is that I always need to grow in my love. And God's always going to put me in a place where he tempers my love, where he tests my love for my wife, for my children, for my family, for sinners. Always, 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 all, God, we always, listen to me, we always need to grow in our love. Because love is a spiritual thing. And how many know we run low sometimes in our spirits? Right? And so I love, we need to grow in our love. I remember when I thought I, I thought I was, I thought I was the guru of love for real. I thought, man, I know how to love people. I can love people. And then something happened that just tested my love to the core, to the bitter end. Like tested my love. I told you guys the story, right? This guy did this thing and God told me when he when you see him hug him and I'm like, God, I don't I don't want to hug him because I don't like him. I don't want to hug him. I don't like him. And God said, just go hug him and tell him you love him. And it was the hardest thing for me to do. The hardest thing for me to do. But remember, what is love? Is it a feeling? No, it's not a feeling. Love is an action. God was trying to teach me how to love again because I forgot how to love. And so I had to go hug this guy, and I said, okay, did it one time. Okay, God, done deal. Did it. Then, I, then the next day I seen him, or next week I seen him, and then God said, go hug him again. I'm like, really? So I went and hugged him, and every time I hugged him, it got easier and easier. And every time I hugged him, I really began to really love this guy, even though he did something really bad to me. I still loved him. I still did it. And after a while, me doing it, me doing that action made me love him. Then I began to have compassion for him. God changed my heart. God uses people, annoying people, people that hurt us to teach us how to love. I'm going to learn how to love. Then get ready to get hurt. Then get ready to be rejected. Then get ready to be pushed back, to be pushed aside to be slandered, to be talked about, to be rejected, and then you still got to love them. God, that's what God does. That's what God does in our marriages. She gets you mad? Love her anyway. He gets you mad? Love him anyway. I know he's a gorilla. I know he has no sense. He has no feelings. He doesn't understand anything. Love him anyway. I ain't going to go the other route. <laughs> Whether they talk to you right, husband. Whether they respect you. Love him anyway. Love him anyway. That's the biggest thing for men, respect. You have to love your wife even when she doesn't respect you. Just what? For reals. We have to learn how to love our wives. We have to learn how to love our husbands. And God uses people to teach us how to love. And God lets people hurt us. He doesn't make them hurt us. Get that. He doesn't make them hurt us. But he allows them to hurt us. And what the devil intends for evil, God always turns it around for the good. I, You know what? I, I tell you right now. If it wasn't for evil, mean people, I wouldn't know how to love today. 
If it wasn't for all the hurt that I uh, received growing up as a Christian, as growing up without God, and as a Christian, going through all whatever it is that I went through, all whatever I got to go through, if it wasn't for that pain, if it wasn't for the for the stabs in the back, if it wasn't for, you know, what, uh, the slander or whatever, if it wasn't for loving people, then they turn on you, I wouldn't know how to love. But because of that, is this making sense to you? Because of that, I know how to love now. And if, and if, and if, if, none, if, none, if, none, if I would have experienced none of that pain, if I would have never experienced the rejection, if I would have never had people slander my name, I wouldn't know how to love. So you want to learn how to love? Then love the unlovable. Love people that hurt you. The Bible says do good to people that persecute you. He says, what good is it if you love people that love you back? Even unbelievers and heathens do that. He says, love the people that don't love you. Love the people who slander your name. Love the people who mock you. Love the people who don't do anything for you. And that's how you learn how to love. Amen? Right there where you are, just go ahead and bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you tonight. We love you, God, and we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. And I pray right now, God, that you would teach us how to love that we would not let somebody else's... Thank you for joining us on our online service. Somebody if you're ready to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's as simple as this prayer. Lord, I am a sinner, and I accept you as my Lord. We'd love to see you here in person. God bless. To learn how to love.